I'm an adult services librarian for the Livermore Public Library and your host, Paul Sevilla. We're delighted that you could join us this evening. We have an impressive panel of individuals with us to discuss racism, a topic that's not always easy to talk about, but incredibly important. First, some housekeeping. All participants, save for the panelists, have been muted and their videos turned off. This is because we have such a large gathering. Per the flyer, community members were asked to submit questions in advance. So thank you to everyone who did submit questions. We will not be able to take any questions during the panel. This said, at the conclusion of the program, you will have the opportunity to complete a survey and as part of that survey, you may ask questions you still have so that they may be shared with the panelists. I will share that link uh, on the chat. This program is part of the 15th annual Livermore Reads Together Community Reading Program, sponsored by the Friends of the Livermore Public Library. This year, we are featuring the graphic novel series March, co-written by John Lewis and Andrew Aiden, and illustrated by Nate Powell. Tonight's program is the first of a series of events inspired by March, and I hope that you will all join us in celebrating this powerful graphic novel series. And now I would like to int introduce our panelists. Vice Mayor Trish Monroe, was elected to the Livermore City Council in 2018. She holds a PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley and has spent her life studying communities and nurturing their growth. Those experiences shape her approach to city issues that include housing, transportation, and developing inclusion and diversity of all kinds. Welcome. Dr. Travis D. Boyce, is Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of African American Studies at San Jose State University. He is also the Co-Director of the Ethnic Studies Collaborative at San Jose State. He is the Co-Editor of the book, Historicizing Fear, Ignorance, Vilification, and Othering, published in 2019 by the University Press of Colorado. Our next panelist is Dr. Winsome Chunu. She is a director of the Multicultural Center at Ohio University. Her areas of research interest are race, educational policy, politics, and popular culture. Her work has appeared in edited collections such as Campus Uprisings, Understanding Injustice and the Resistance Movement on College Campuses. Documenting the Black Experience, Essays on African-American History, Culture, and Identity in Nonfiction Films, and Before Obama, a Reappraisal of Black Reconstruction Era Politicians. Additionally, she is the co-editor of Historicizing Fear, Ignorance, Vilification, and Othering. Shayna Peet serves as the Director of Curriculum and Community Engagement for the Center for Excellence in Nonprofits, a nonprofit capacity building organization based in Redwood City, California. She served as a founding executive director of Partners for Change of the Tri-Valley, a community-focused poverty alleviation program. After receiving a BS in international business and a doctor of juris juris jurisprudence, Shana practiced law for eight years before moving to the Bay Area. Welcome. Our next panelist is Robin Clare, who hails from the San Francisco Bay Area and is a graduate of Berkeley High School. Growing up, she was involved with the renowned Americans Conservatory Theater and performed in several main stage production as a teen and young adult. After graduating from Northwestern University, Robin settled in Los Angeles, 
and landed a develop, development executive position at Walt Disney Studios. While she was at Disney, Robin incorporated her personal experience as a young actress and helped to work toward building a diverse palette in front of the camera and behind it. She currently does public speaking and performance storytelling in the Bay Area. Robin is also a writer and her debut novel, Ink for the Beloved, was published in 2020 by Ingram Spark. Welcome, Robin. Last but not least, I would like to introduce tonight's discussion leader. She is an award-winning author of eight books honoring African-American culture and history. She is a proud and active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Additionally, she is a contributor to the Berkeley Historical Society, the South Berkeley Legacy Project, and a member of the National League of American Pan Women. Welcome, Tina Jones Williams. And now I turn it over to Tina for our panel conversation. Thank you, Paul. I, I just want to take a, just one moment to thank you, Paul, for putting this program together and the library for hosting us as well. And this panel for um, their time this evening and their willingness to discuss this difficult topic and those that submitted questions as well. So with that, let's get started. I'm going to be reading from my handy dandy phone here. So if I'm looking down, that's the reason why. And I'm going to attempt to do it without my glasses. So here we go. So the first question is for Trish as vice mayor of Livermore. Although by comparison, Livermore is a small city, the assumption is it's merely a microcosm of much larger cities with many of the same issues and challenges. What are the major challenges cities face in the next few years? Okay, well, um, this, this was a hard one for me to look at just because uh, as I think I mentioned, it can go so many ways. So I wanna start actually by just sort of framing the concept of how, or that the, the idea that a cities are not all the same and that one of the things about Livermore is that it is a city of under 100,000 that works pretty hard to keep its, uh, to, um, it, it, that, that's about as big as a city can get and still feel somewhat intimate, if you will. Um, it's also a city, cities of that size typically are run by staff with the council members setting policy and they set policy with, with community members. So that's important background because that's, that's distinct from some of the much larger, that, that makes them distinct from some of the much larger cities um, which have different, different sets of policy and where it's a little harder to engage with people. The reason I'm saying this is that one of the things that makes it possible that it's possible in Livermore to really reach out to many different groups of people and to, to to have conversations between people. Okay, so having said that, what are the problems? Well, like all other places in the United States, there are a set of about five major problems that we have that we're gonna have going forward. Um, so we have COVID, we have the economic distress that's caused by COVID that's uh, going to be um, that exacerbates the already unequal socioeconomic situation that we're in. We have uh, systemic racism that we are dealing with. We have um, ongoing polarization and, um, um, ah, shoot, <laughs> insurrection, word I want beyond that, the, um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, my words just went away. <laughs> um, and, um, but you know, it's the bad things that happened in the capital that, go, that come locally. Right. Um, and, um, and I'm sorry, because I really wanted to get that one there. Um, um, so all of those things impact us at the local level as much as they do at the, at the national level. So 
Um, and then there's all the things that cities have to just take care of to make sure it happens. You want to talk about public safety? The biggest public safety issue is making sure people are taken care of. So they have food, they have water, and, and water is, um, you know, that, they, that it works, that they have infra, you know, infrastructure. All of those things are ongoing. If cities are not able to take care of them, people do not do well. Um, so that's sort of the under uh, the that undergirds everything else we talk about with that what let's talk specifically about um the polarization the systemic racism um the domestic terrorism and the way that that comes into there see i found it um the way that that comes into city life um what we're seeing at, at the city level yeah so uh, at, in livermore um, following the murder of George Floyd, we put we uh, constituted a subcommittee of the of the council uh, that, with help from residents, we we started with calling it public safety. We turned it to uh, equity and inclusion at the request of minority uh, uh, community members that we spoke to, who said, "Hey, look, it's not just about policing; it's about the." It's about systemic racism, and we're really trying to delve into that. That has resulted in um, really some difficult conversations um, that's resulted in some uh, not pleasant actions, let's just say. You know what, However, we're gonna circle back sorry, on that. I told you, sorry about that. That's, a, that's all right. We'll circle back to that because that will dovetail into another question that I'm going to ask you in a bit. So before we leave this topic, I wanna get Travis, um, to talk a little bit from a bigger city perspective. Are the, are the problems similar? Are they different? Are they bigger? Um, what's, what's the perspective? Absolutely. So hello, everyone. Um, so I am relatively new to San Francisco. I moved here in July, on July 1st when I first started my job at San Jose State. Um, and I moved from teeny tiny Greeley, Colorado uh, now to San Francisco, California. So uh, certainly that big town, small town, you can see differences, also similarities. So I think this is a really good question to interrogate um, in terms of particularly the city of Livermore being this microcosm. Um, I would make that ar further argument about San Francisco being a microcosm of the United States of America, even the microcosm of the world, just because of various uh, ethnic groups, representations across the world. But I mean, it's no doubt. Um, and again, I'm gonna speak specifically for my limited experience being here and also because we're under restrictions due to COVID-19 where I can't go out and interact with folks daily. But from what I'm seeing, and this is just purely as a result of, and this, and I'm just uh, backtracking of what Trish is saying, because I think she's correct in terms of the conversation of this question, you know, COVID, the racial uh, reckoning that happened in this country last summer with the murder of George Floyd, the 2020 presidential election, um, as well as what happened at the Capitol uh, a few weeks ago, you do see elements of these issues that play out uh, with regards to San Francisco. So, you know, for example, homelessness is, is extremely rampant here in San Francisco. Economic inequality of who can pay rent. I mean, good Lord. I mean, from the rent I pay here in San Francisco, I can buy a three-story home in my home state of South Carolina. Uh, so the economic inequality is real. Um, I'm seeing sort of a, is, is gentrification, the legacies of gentrification is here in San Francisco, yet people are leaving San Francisco, particularly young white um, professionals are leaving the city for, because they have to work from home, which is leaving uh, sort of a depression here in San Francisco. Um, so those are things I see with regards to just a broader umbrella of issues that uh, San Francisco fundamentally is going to shift in the coming years as a result of COVID and as a result of people exiting. So, okay, I appreciate those two perspectives. Um, so the next question is for Winsome. 
And this one is uh, specifically from a patron. A couple of different shades of this same question from patrons. It seems like racist beliefs and right-wing conspiracy theories go together. What can I do about my relatives who continue to believe in harmful conspiracy theories like QAnon? How can we end it? <laughs> I I always uh, thank you so much, and I I I often laugh at this, not because it's funny but because it's somehow really a hard thing to answer, right? So basically we're saying, how can I help my family and friends who believe in these conspiracies such as the people who attacked the Capitol in on January 6th to say like, these are not real. And that is really, really, really hard because you we are talking about regular average Americans such as myself coming up against our former president, Donald Trump, as well as our members of Congress, like Senator Cruz, Hawley, and, and all the other members of the House right now that we're grappling with. So that is really, really hard. So for me, I often say, this is what I say to my students. Go to various websites. There are a lot of information that's out there about QAnon, about the conservative rhetoric, even the liberal rhetoric, right? Visit all the websites. Review everything that everyone is saying. And then based on what you know from what I have taught you about how to decipher rhetoric versus facts, then make a decision. Makes sense. Because I, I think that's where we are right now as a nation. Right. Is that's what we are grappling with. Is, so let well, me, my former president said this, so it must be true. <laughs> okay, let me stop you because I'm going to ask Shana. Uh-huh, go ahead. Sort of a follow-on to that same question. Shana, and this is also from patrons. Since the election of President Biden, I have received distressing emails from an old friend who clearly supports President Trump as well as white supremacist views. He calls Black Lives Matter supporters thugs, but no comment about the rioters in DC. Should I just ignore and block his emails? What can we do about acquaintances and relatives who hold such views? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm yeah. She, her, Aya, thank you so much for convening this, this discussion today and thank you for that question. Um, so my opinion is that it's important that we show up during this time. Every single day, uh, for some of us, for the past five years, you know, the election run up through the, the, the presidency of, of 45, uh, it's been intense day after day for five years. For some folks, it's been intense since he left office, right? Um, it's really important that folks show up. It can feel scary, it can feel overwhelming, it can feel exhausting and infuriating, but it's our duty, right, as Americans 
as voters. And frankly, what I keep talking about is like as neighbors, right? Um, I was very tempted to feel scared on the 6th of January by what I was witnessing. Um, we all saw it. I mean, there was no response to a very deliberate and tele teleport, what do you call it? They, they telegraphed it <laughs> in advance, what was going to happen. And they said, all right, six o'clock, we, we're here, we're ready to do this. And, and there was no response, right? Um, but I really caught myself. I feel like my ancestors caught me if I'm telling the truth. And they were like, nah, um, these were your neighbors yesterday, <laughs> right? Right, And right. Um, they'll be your neighbors tomorrow. So you can't feel fear. You can't crawl in a hole and shut it down. So as a black woman, I don't have that luxury. I don't have that desire. And I'm gonna make a presumption that's based on just demographics here in Livermore. I'm, I'm guessing the person who asked that question probably didn't look like me. Um, and I feel very strongly that in this time, white folks have to show up, right? We need you. And I'm a wholehearted believer. This is not our struggle in many ways. We didn't create this beast, this monster. We will not be the folks to disarm it. Let me stop you there. I got because more. I'm going to ask Travis to um, answer a very big question that dovetails on what you just said. Regarding race as a country, how did we get where we are now? And what is our path forward? Oh, thank you so much. And again, Shana, thank you. No, this is a great conversation and I hope we talk more afterwards. Um, sir, I mean, we can go on for days in terms of how we got here, but to give a short answer, and again, I teach African-American history. Um, and you know the discipline of a US history is near and dear to my heart. And you cannot ignore issues since 1619 and even 1776. So we can look at specific policies of how we got here, like the Three-Fifths Compromise, which was designed to give um, white land-owning Southerners an electoral advantage. So if we want to talk about the Electoral College, let's take it back to the early days of this country. We can go to 1857 and look at the Dred Scott decision that ruled that Black folks are not citizens. We can go to 1896 and look at Plessy B. Ferguson. So we got here because this country wanted to go maintain white supremacy. And looking specifically through the lens of policy, we can see how we got here. Also, I want to add that we've ignored it. We've ignored racism. We've ignored that racism doesn't exist or, you know, um, everything's not about racism. You know, why can't we all just get along? Or members of Congress, let's just move past January 6th. This is how we got here. This is our, the history of our country. And we need to tell the story of our country accurately. So what is our path forward? Great question. Um, certainly, um, if it were up to me, every university student, but hopefully K through 12 students, but every university student should take American history and they should learn these policies that shaped our country. And I would encourage the audience to go to um, Facing History and Ourselves. That's a great resource that looks at a critical lens of history. But if we were to move past this, folks need to re-educate themselves. We need to put things in a system where we are telling a accurate history of this country instead of denying what this country was. We can't be great, but we're not great. Right. Right. Okay. Let, let me, Robin, let me ask you again, this is to build on that. What does it mean to be anti-racist? 
how is it different from simply not being racist? Um, that is a great, great question. And I think that there are distinctions, although it sounds like they're the same. Um, this is how I would um, describe it. And actually I wrote down some notes on it. So I'm going to read off of it. Um, okay. All right, so here, both of them involve constant work. This isn't like you can just get up and go, oh, you know what, I'm gonna be non-racist today. You know, it, it is a continual thing. Um, not being racist means that you're checking your own biases and we all have them. We all have these biases. Um, and you're checking them and you're doing this on a personal level and you are, you're making a decision to work through this. And you will find little things over time, little ideas of things that you were taught um, that you realize, oh, wow, that's a racist thought. But we're gonna have to find that ourselves. Now, I think anti-racist is more active on a, a larger level. Um, it means that you're acknowledging that not only can people be racist, that there are social constructs in place that are inherently racist. So um, and it's more of an activist type of role and you are educating and informing others. So it's not just a matter of like, how many times have people at work heard a racist joke? Now they might hear it and kind of shake their head and go, oh, I hated that joke. We now need to, and specifically white people, because a lot of this is really on them. They need to step up. They need to call the person out and say that was a racist joke. And it, it means getting uncomfortable. That's what it really, this all means. You have to understand that um, it's so easy to ignore and move on. They want to ignore and move on, but you can't unless you get uncomfortable. Um, I want to really quick say in terms of history, um, one issue that I've had with the way his, uh, history is taught in high school, particularly when there are classrooms filled with white students and there are very few kids of color, is that teachers will hit areas like after the Civil War, which was a very violent time period in our country. A lot of the lynchings started then. There was, I mean, and I literally, in my son's class, and this is at Berkeley High School, all right? Um, I noticed that the teacher was skimming through this time period and jumping right to reconstruction. And I asked him, I said, why? Well, first I told my son, go ask him why he's doing that. And um, the teacher said, because the, he didn't want the other kids to be uncomfortable. And I was like, oh, so we're really worried about the preciousness of these kids white kids, because this was an advanced history class, yet you're putting the two black kids and you're making them sit there and go, and wait a minute, there's stuff being left out. And it then puts it on their shoulders to then raise their hands and call into question. And now they look like they're starting something. Right. And it should not be on the shoulders of my son to point out if a teacher is missing something and the teacher is only jumping over something because he doesn't want kids to get upset. Well, we, our country is built off of violence. And as long as we ignore that, as long as we wanna move on, as long as we honor these, having memorials down South of these generals who are, who are created an insurrection, we shouldn't be honoring that. So you can't move on until you really know what you're trying to move on from. So that's my I agree. I agree. So with that, Trish, I want to talk, ask you a question that is um, specific to your role as vice mayor. It says one of the areas of focus in your role as vice mayor is the equity and inclusion subcommittee. Can you tell us about the work and the community's reactions? Again, oh, yeah. the assumption is Livermore is a mirror of other cities. I, I can. Um, can I do a, just a really quick, uh, not response, but add on to what Robin said? Of course. Okay. Um, so I'm Jewish. And one of the things I look at is 
what Germany did after the Holocaust. And I look at what Germany did and I look at what Poland did. And what Poland did is to deny. And what Germany did was, I think they had a little bit of help doing this nevertheless, um, to reconcile with. And uh, I would prefer to be like Germany, not like Poland. So anyway, that's, you know, <laughs> moving on. Um, so equity and inclusion. Um, so I think I, I started to respond to that, forgetting that that question was coming along the way. Um, and so I talked a little bit about, this was in response to the murder of George Floyd. I talked a little bit about, we started it uh, with looking at public safety. I, I have to say that from the start, I was concerned with that because I felt like that was uh, using the uh, public, the, using the police force as a scapegoat for the larger systemic issues. Um, if you fix, if you fix this, we're good, right? We're all good. It's like mm, I don't think so. Um, and so, and that in fact was borne out in terms of the conversations that we had with uh, members of the community. So what we did is we brought uh, um, the, um, the now, the, now the mayor, then the vice mayor. So it's, we've switched roles have switched a little bit, but uh, the um, Bob Warner, who's now the mayor, and I were then the vice mayor and council member, and um, we brought back to the council, you know, we'd like to expand this, uh, make it more about equity and inclusion. We did that. We then opened it up to the community. We got a ton of responses. We said, well, we're about inclusion, so let's include. Um, so we had, we had like almost 40, 40 to 50 people. We walked them through, okay, figure out where your areas are. We ended up with four different areas of, of concentration. One was culture, one was this public safety area, one was uh, youth engagement, and one was what we, I generally call economics, which is really dealing with the economic impact of racism, which also tips over into, you know, just to, you know, the economic inequality in general. So there's an overlap there. So those were the four groups. Um, and then we got to work and uh, went through uh, the sort of the beginning stages of forming, forming working groups. This is to advise the subcommittee, which would then go back to the council, which would then approve everything. And that's important to recognize because what then happened is the culture group had an idea that they wanted to sort of look at the signs and symbols around Livermore. And people have different opinions about different signs and symbols. One of those is the thin blue line flag. Um, that got spun up into uh, the city council has, this is the working group. This is the community members taking it to the subcommittee, which is that's gonna take it to the city council. Got spun up saying the city council has forbidden the thin blue line flag to be flown. And they're gonna come and they're gonna take you away and re-educate you. So I got educated on the thin blue line flag, let me tell you. Um, it was, we're still dealing with some of the fallout from that. that it, you know, the result is, is, is that it's open. I knew this was gonna happen anyway. We knew we were gonna have to have conversations. You have to have conversations because Livermore is in fact a microcosm of the, of, the, of the country. So we've now opened that can of worms and we are in the process of figuring out how to take it forward so that we can engage the community, the larger community, which is now, um, I'm not going to say woke, but woke it up <laughs> um, in some, some important ways to going forward. How we're going to do that is unclear, but I will say that I believe the best way to do it is to stay away from ideology as much as possible and have conversations around things of substance within the community. So how are we going to solve, you know, isn't this something we can agree on? Don't we all want, you know, turning to public safety, don't we all want, for example, the police force to be doing the work that the police force needs to do. Do they, you know, is, is this an area that you, you think they actually want to be engaged in? Oh, no, I don't think that. Well, let's talk about that and going forward like, like that. So that's, that's as, as quick as I could make it. <laughs> I appreciate it. So the next question that I have is, I'm going to ask the same question of Winsome and Travis. So how important is the Black Lives Matter movement in helping to fight racial injustice and inequality? So Winsome, I'll start with you. Where are you, Winsome? 
you're muted, Winston. For me, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is crucial in this area, considering everything that has happened uh, post George Floyd. Can you hear me? Yes. And see me? Okay, great. Yes. As well as also keeping in mind that they were also nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, the Black Lives Matter movement around racial injustice and equity. And so for me, I think they play, they are playing a crucial role with what happened with George Floyd in terms of bringing awareness around the country with the way people responded in our country. And it's not just black people, it, it was people from all racial group. But additionally, because I am Jamaican and I also, I have a master's degree in United States foreign policy is that I look at what is happen, glo happening globally. But, and so, understanding that what happened regarding George Floyd also had an impact in what happened globally. For example, if we look, look at many post-colonial countries, specifically the United Kingdom, for example, there were statues of slave owners and masters that were torn down. We look in Belgium, that what happened with, um, uh, oh, come on, somebody help me here, Belgium and- Le Leopold. Uh-huh, Leopold and what, and, and like, look, I will never, until I get to my grave, forgive Leopold for what he did in the Congo and in, West Africa. We look at the French and what they have done in Haiti and in West Africa, and that the fact that most of these countries continue to pay restitution to France. And so for me, this, this was a wake up call that our country will be grappling with for decades to come. And when I say, I mean decades about what we've done and what we need to do to reconcile what we have done to the Caribbean and to West Africa in, in particular. And again, I'm saying West Africa because I don't even wanna go in on the British and what they've done in the Caribbean, in Jamaica and in Ghana and in other places. And so for me, I was excited because of what happened with George Floyd and God rest his soul. And I, I can never, ever, ever, ever say to his family, express my, how I am feeling about what happened to their son. But I can talk about conceptually, intellectually, the way I feel as a colonial subject and what that triggered around the world. That I have never felt more grateful for what that highlighted. Travis, well, me, I'm, I'm putting it over to you, you now. There because I need to move on to Travis, but I want to point out what um, Shana said. She said, he's our son. So, we need to we need to be clear on that and embrace yep. that he's ours. Uh -huh. Yep, 
Absolutely. So Travis, same question. Do you need me to repeat it? Oh no, I'm I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, um, I I think if we look at Black Lives Matter of why they were founded, you know, this was in wake of the the acquittal of George of, of George Zimmerman mm -hmm. um, five years ago, the Trayvon Martin's murder, um, and last summer's resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and how it is embedded into our daily discourse. Like, you know, I can't step outside of my building here in San Francisco or walk around the block without seeing a Black Lives Matter flag or graffiti, things like that. There's this sense of legitimacy to it that is catching on. So certainly for a group that uh, is fighting uh, for racial inequality and the importance of it and bring attention to my city, my new city now in San Francisco that's relatively white and wealthy and whether people are using, using performative protests or they're legitimate, they're really interested in Black Lives Matter, to see it all over says that Black Lives Matter is completely legit. And we can also look at this from right wingers. They are scared of Black Lives Matter, and they're using Black Lives Matter as a con as a um, as a format to um, delegitimize Black Lives Matter movement. And then, if we look at today's book quickly about Congressman John Lewis, the late John Lewis, um, and again to put this into a historical context. If John Lewis was coming of age in 2020 and not 1960, he would have been heavily involved in Black Lives Matter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit, um, but not hugely. Shana, what impact, if any, does the rejection of the election results by lawmakers have on minorities in this country? So this question is interesting. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I've moved away or I'm currently moving away from the term minorities. Um, so I'm gonna speak with regard to people of color from a black woman's perspective. However, I think there's applicability to um, folks that have been pushed to the margins, right? And for me, um, the impact of what we saw, you know, folks rejecting a free and fair election in our own country, um, it was a very clear message to people that look like me and identify the way that I do. Or I would imagine from what I'm observing and interactions I'm having with folks, other, other folks that are pushed to the margins, you know, immigrants, um, folks that identify uh, in a gender expansive way, um, et cetera. Um, it, was, it was a big message that this is not your country from the uh, folks themselves that orchestrated this, this concept of the steel, you know, the folks that supported it showed up at the Capitol um, from the top of our nation's government all the way through local government. It had support, it had roots, it had backing. And frankly, we got to see that it had funding and, and it was armed, right? Um, it, it, law enforcement with their inaction co-signed on that notion that this is not our country. And no matter how deep my roots go, no matter how many centuries back, my family has been here. Folks want me to know this is not for you. And it was very disheartening. And it, this is the conundrum. This you know, makes me feel very like the words of James Baldwin are, are so real today. You know, to be in a constant state of rage, right? To be black in America. Because the country that you love, the country you call home, the place where your ancestors' blood, sweat, tears, and bones rests 
you love it, it doesn't love you. And anytime it gets a chance to tell you, a lot of folks are here to put the megaphone up to that message. And um, it's amazing. I was listening to um, This American Life yesterday. A friend of mine recommended that I listen to a particular episode and it was profound. It's talking about the lasting impacts of all that's happened. And, um, you know, we're going to have to really, we're going to be digging deep. The, the hurt that's been done here um, is one that, it was said earlier, we haven't fully acknowledged it. And as a result, we are not able to heal. And in that, in that podcast, I'll just say, they were talking about how you have the image of that officer Goodman who was with the, the telescopic baton holding down the people from coming up the stairs of the Capitol. You have um, folks who, we can go back further than that, folks who showed up to vote in a pandemic, lined up, even though they were trying to be disenfranchised, right? Like you have that, you have this officer at the Capitol who's like the last line, 30 feet away, the last line of defense between some of our highest legislators. Black folks are showing up. <laughs> like we don't know how else we can show that like we want this. And Amen. we know and we want to fight for it, hello? Mm -hmm. And then the, the image that they gave in this podcast was when it was all said and done, it was folks that, those insurgents got to go home and they're, you know, drive their nice cars back to their nice homes. And then the people that were left to clean up the debris, the people that were left to pick up the pieces of our democracy look uh -huh. like, they look like me. Absolutely, yep, yep. At every mm -hmm. stage, at every phase, we don't have anything else to do but show up for our country. And it's just, um, it's really difficult. And the one thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll, I'll let, let it go back, but Travis, your point about, I think it was you who said, in the protests this summer, seeing so many people of different races, mm -hmm. ethnic colors, wearing different kind of traditional garments, mm -hmm. tattoos and markings, showing mm -hmm. up in support of Black life, that's a moment. That it is, is a cool moment. So let's, and, let me build uh, on that. Let's say one last, okay. one last thing. I'll Go ahead. But I, I just really, and, and people who were young, you know, I, I feel very strongly that they have been taught this version of America, right? The one that was glossed over. And they're reading and they're looking out their windows and they're looking on their phones and they're like, this isn't what, wait a minute. And they're calling BS on us. Absolutely, Shana. And I'm mm -hmm. here for it. Yep. As a foreigner, absolutely, I endorse that. So let me let me then build on that. You, each one of you, has told a story. You've shared your thoughts. You've shared your feelings. So, Robin, the question that I have for you is what role does storytelling have in helping to bridge the racial divide? It has an enormous, enormous role. Um, you know, it used to be that, uh, you know, well, I think this is still kind of the case. You have these wonderfully uh, constructed and, 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 you know, these, these courses that deal with, you know, ethnic studies and African-American studies. And I have found that many times the students in those classrooms are the ethnicity that's being taught. And the kids that should be there, quite honestly, are the kids who, well, are the white kids. I didn't see that many white kids taking African-American studies. Um, I don't see very many white males taking gender studies. And it's unfortunate, they're the ones that need to learn. So if they're not gonna sit there in a classroom, then we need to give them this information through the storytelling, through books, and in particular in the media with television and film. And um, you know, one of the things that you know, 
you know, Hollywood likes to think that it's woke and that they're ahead of the game, yet they do, they're, they're a crucial part of um, continually showing, you know, the stereotypes and negative stereotypes of people of color. Well, it took them a long time to realize that they shouldn't always cast the villains or the, um, the, uh, the criminals as black or any ethnicity all the time. They loved doing that in the 70s. I mean, you, there was one time a report where if you look at Hill Street Blues, the number of kids that were, or the characters that were the perps, it was an enormous a, a number that were, that were black. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, but that was, those images are the types of things that filter into uh, the general public. And so they start believing, oh yeah, well, of course, black, you know, they're a criminal. Um, Right now, one of the pressing things that's in uh, what I see in scripts, um, television, but particularly, yeah, particularly in television, is the need to have characters of color who have their own agency. And by that, it means that they're not there just to service the white character. So what started happening was that you would have these ensemble shows and they would throw in all these different types of diverse people. But you would notice that the diverse people were really just there to service the white character. They didn't have their own families. That's so key. It's so important that we see characters of color have families because then it, it takes away the other. And um, if you start seeing the generations, you see them with the kids and they can't all be single moms and all those other various things, but you need to see family. And then you, people watching the shows, watching the stories, view these characters as whole. They're not just the person at work. And is, it is slow going, but it is starting to happen. And you know, you're gonna see more and more television shows because this is an issue and it's being brought up. And it's, um, you know, it takes people of color being in the writer's room and saying, hey, you know what? Um, you know, so-and-so, it's time for so-and-so to have a boyfriend or girlfriend, they're dating too. They're not just there to be the sidekick. Um, and, you know, but you still see, I mean, like there's a, there's a show on Netflix, I'm not gonna get into Bridgerton, but okay, but there's a newer, there's another show that just came out. And this is because it's a big issue in what I'll say, urban fantasy and paranormal, because those are very popular with young people. So you kind of want to see what shows they're watching. And even in supernatural worlds, you're still having characters of color who are servicing the white character. Um, and you wouldn't know it necessarily if you weren't watching the show. You see a diverse cast in the picture that's advertising and you go, oh, look, there's a black girl, there's a Hispanic girl. Oh, that's a device, diverse cast. But then if you're watching the show, you start to realize, oh, wait, they're just there to scold the white character. They're just there to, you know, they, they don't have their own storyline. The only, and so these are, these are just things that are very important as we move forward and in storytelling that um, a lot of the stories need to, I mean, people of color have to be presented as whole and they can't only have stories that have racial elements in them. That's the other thing. Um, I'm gonna stop you there mm -hmm. because that's, I mean, that's kind of the sum total of it. They have to be shown as whole, whole people. So we have like five minutes left and I wanna ask each one of you very quickly, you can answer either, what are good books that people should read? Or what can people do to be allies? So I'll start with you, Trish. All right, um, I actually wrote this down, but you have to give me a second to get out of, find my list. I, somehow got into full screen. Okay, I had three books that uh, I thought were uh, really influential for me. Um, one of them is Jennifer Eberhardt's uh, book, Biased, um, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We Think, See, Think, and Do. 
Um, and um, I, I, I'm just going to give the books, but she, she tells a really, uh, she's got a TED talk and in it she tells some incredibly compelling stories. Um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. It's been around for a while. It's still one of the best for uh, understanding um, the new Jim Crow. Um, so mass incarceration in an age of colorblindness. And then Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, uh, The Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, um, which uh, does, it. I, I found that to be so the most um, insightful book for explaining where, uh, you know, how, uh, inequality, systemic racism gets gets integrated into housing in a de jure manner as opposed to a de facto manner. I had understood it previous to that mostly as a de facto, um, understanding it as a matter of law from the highest levels on down and then how that plays into uh, what comes out of the Civil War, well, out of back to 1619, um, you know, I, was, was really important for me. So those would be the three I'd recommend. Thank you winsome either books or how to be an ally okay so here's what i would recommend here's what i am recommending articles no blacks is not a sexual preference it's racism why poor people stay poor because i live in appalachia and our Appalachia, as some of us, as some people would say, and understanding that I am also around poor white people living in trailers without electricity and running water, and that I understand in some way, not completely, because that's not my experience, that lifestyle. The other article I recommend is how white feminism oppressed black women. Black people opposition is pushing Trump to vote. What does it mean to be a black traveler? Annual Kwanzaa crawl, Kwanzaa crawl rather, brings in $250,000 for black businesses. New studies show that Black teens face racial discrimination five times a day. Black people and people of color are not interchangeable. Andrew Jackson was a slaver and an ethnic cleanser and a tyrant. And as we're thinking about that, keep in mind that President Biden is trying to remove him from the $20 bill and re replacing that with Harriet Tubman. And the other book I would recommend is No Equal Justice, which looks um, specifically at the justice system. And it's this is nothing new. That's This is for me and people that are race conscious because they're, we know there's some of us, a part of our community who are not, is no equal justice, which looks at what Michelle Alexander did before she did, which is how the system is set up against people of color. And this I'm book gonna, is written I'm by gonna a have white to stop person. you, Winsome. I know that you can, you have plenty of resources. And if that's you'd it, like I'm to, done. I'm done right there. But it but I would like for you to share those with Paul in um, an email if you could, so that we can get it out to people. I absolutely will. I'm in the process of compiling a document for a class that were that was mostly consisted of white females. And I am in the state of Ohio and 85% of our teachers are white females. And for me, that's problematic because of everything that we know about 
what that means in terms of in the classroom and how students of color are perceived. Right, right. So okay, yes, I'm, I'm absolutely, you. I, Soro, I am willing to share all of that. Okay. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh-huh. Robin, book um, okay. or how to be an ally or both? Uh, all right, so I'm going to share what I told the friends, the white friends of my son when they, when he was a teenager. Uh, because if, if uh, you know, teenagers are gonna be teenagers, kids are gonna be kids. If something happens, if the authorities start showing up, do not flee, do not leave my child behind. You're, the impulse is gonna be there. You must stay there and be a witness. Do not leave my kid. You have to stand there and be a witness. And they understood that. Um, I also am gonna say, people should read the book, Just Mercy. Brian Stevens says, uh, Just Mercy. Uh, the, the movie is wonderful, but the book goes into a lot more depth. Um, and I'm also gonna say, There, There by Tommy Orange is a fantastic book dealing with Native Americans um, and just, culturally and history and bringing um, their racism that has, you know, up until contemporary times and is done through a family, it's generational. That's it. Thank you. Shana, books or ally or both? I put some books in the chat and I will um, share some good listening. A lot of times if we don't have time for reading, a podcast will do. So I'm a big fan of the podcast Code Switch. Um, I'm a big fan of the podcast called Good Ancestor Podcast by Layla, um, Layla Saad. But books I've read thick by Tressie McMillan Cottom just very recently. I've just downloaded um, Bishop Michael Curry's new book, Love is the Way and Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson, so. Thank you, Travis. Yes, uh, really quick. So first, certainly the book uh, that we're reading for uh, the series, March, is very fantastic. It's fantastic. And it just answers a previous question about the importance of storytelling. Um, I, you know, I can hear John Lewis's voice as you read along through the graphic novel. So I encourage everyone that's attending tonight to purchase the book and read that. Um, I would also recommend Dr. Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, a classic book from 1995, uh, the late Derek Bell, um, who coined and was part of the critical race theory um, uh, scholars uh, that coined the phrase and um, uh, written a legal um, scholarship in relationship to race. So it's called Faces at the Bottom of the Well. And then finally, um, I was just thinking about this. Um, there's a book by Stephanie E. Jones Rogers. Um, they were her property, white women as slave owners in the American South. And I'll say this, um, as we, you know, I'm obsessed about who was getting arrested and uh, from the Capitol riots. And these are not your stereotypical working class whites. You know, these, th there's a woman that flew a from a private plane from Texas to the Capitol, to storm the Capitol. You know, there's a, a young woman that allegedly stole Nancy Pelosi's computer, you know, and tried to sell it to the Russians. I mean, what's really going on here? You know, and finally I was reading today, there's a young woman from West Virginia um, that's a student at the University of Kentucky and she seems uh, unapologetic about the whole storm of the Capitol. So I would encourage folks to read the book. It's called, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. But let's think broadly, specifically how not just white men, but white women are the gatekeepers and perpetuate white supremacy in our country. That book is fantastic. And it's, I have to read it in small doses as a black woman. There's some things that are really challenging, but it's so important. And another thing I wrote earlier was about slave narratives. Every mm -hmm. few years, I make it a point to go back and read slave narratives 
It's amazing how many people come through our educational system and don't even know there's a treasure trove of firsthand um, folks that documented firsthand accounts from enslaved people here in this country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's free, it's available from the government websites, it's organized by state, by time, there are a million ways to look at it and it's so important that we don't forget those stories. So I wanted to mention that. Tina, if I, I could jump in that. right here just to quickly talk, say that Sims, the founder of gynecology, experimented on Black slave women without anesthesia. And that is a reason today, as women, all of us, white, Black, Asian, African American, Hispanic, you name it, that we can have all the tests that we do now to prevent cancer was because they experimented on black save slave women without anesthesia because supposedly black people are stronger and they don't feel pain. Right. So every time as a white woman, <coughs> you go to get a pap smear, etc. I need you all to remember that it was your black sisters who faced this shit without anesthesia so that you all can enjoy all the privileges that we do as women about our womanhood. You know, the hardest part of being a moderator of this kind of discussion is having to stop the discussion, particularly with people who are so passionate and well-informed and just interesting. Um, however, we committed that we would be done in an hour and we are. And I just wanna thank you all for sharing so freely with the people that Zoomed in to hear your thoughts. It has been a pleasure to spend this hour with you and it is my hope that we'll be able to do it again. So Paul, with that, um, back to you. I, think, I wish I had a, a way to uh, do a round of applause sound, uh, but a big uh, round of applause and thank you to uh, to all of you, to all our panelists, uh, you are all so uh, amazing and uh, so generous with your time. And and uh, um, uh, and Tina, thank you so much for for leading the discussion. Uh, uh, you did such a great job. Um, I can't thank you all enough. And uh, this uh, just. Uh, Wanted to let everyone know that uh, this is uh, this has been recorded and it'll be on uh, the library's YouTube channel, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, subscribe to the library's YouTube channel to find out when it's up. Um, and uh, lots of great reading suggestion suggestions. We're well, uh, definitely going to uh, compile a, a reading list or a list of suggestions that our panelists recommended, and we'll find a way to share that with you all, maybe through social media. Uh, at this point, I want to once again uh, share the the link to the survey. Uh, I hope you can all see that. I'm also going to share my screen to give you uh, uh, to show you uh, the link to the survey. That's very important to access that link and let us know your your uh, what you think and if. And to, to ask your questions you have for the panelists, I'll be sharing that with our panelists and it, it uh, will definitely uh, uh, help to, to, to shape maybe another program um, down the road. Um, again, uh, I wanna thank our, our panelists uh, and I wanna thank all of you who attended. 